This is the fifth episode in a series covering the design and construction of a clock for my relay computer. In the last episode, things got a bit mathsy as I attempted to calculate resistor and capacitor values to achieve my target timing. Here's a quick recap of where I've got to so far in this series. I've set out the basic design for a relay ring counter, which can produce a clock signal, and because I want the clock to run at 6 Hz, I was able to work backwards to deduce that each relay in the counter needs to be held on for 83 milliseconds. I didn't quite get as far as achieving that timing, but I did show that I can predict, with reasonable accuracy, the voltage across an RC network after a given time. The challenge for this episode, then, is to pick a resistor and capacitor value that can hold the relay contacts open for 83 milliseconds after external power is removed. Before we get to that, though, there's some unfinished business from last time. Everything was looking fine for the charging phase. The blue line shows the external voltage source coming into the relay, and the red line shows the voltage over the capacitor. As expected, we see a curve on the red line where the capacitor charges up over time. I calculated that the capacitor should reach around 10.27 volts after 20 milliseconds, and reading off the red trace, it's pretty close. Bear in mind that the capacitor and resistor won't be exactly the values written on them. Each has a tolerance, and individual components vary a tiny amount. And that's mostly why the value won't be exactly what I calculated. At this point, it's worth taking a closer look at those probes. The blue scope feed is on the left and is measuring the voltage over the relays and RC network. In our schematic, that's the point here. The red feed on the right is between the resistor and capacitor, but note how it differs to the schematic. Spotted it? The resistor and capacitor have switched place. This is so when I place the red probe here, I can read the voltage over the capacitor as it charges. The circuit still functions as I'd expect when charging though, um, because it doesn't matter if the capacitor comes first or the resistor in an RC network that's charging. Either way, the current flow is restricted by the resistor, which slows down the rate the capacitor can charge up. The discharge circuit though is a different story altogether. The red line is curving down as we'd expect, and also reads off roughly where I'd expect after 20 milliseconds. But just look at the blue line. What on earth's going on there? But with the schematic back in place, hopefully it's a bit easier to spot. The discharge path goes through the resistor and then through the relay coils. Effectively, this means the blue probe is now right in the middle of a potential divider. With a rearranged version of this circuit, it's even easier to spot. Using the formula for a basic potential divider circuit, we can place in the R1 value of 220 ohms and the R2 value, which is made up of two 1029 ohm resistors in parallel. This result states that the voltage at the blue probe will be roughly 70% of the voltage at the red probe. Looking back to the scope trace, we can see that at the start of the blue line, ignoring the dip for a moment, it's around 8.4 volts, which is 70% of 12 volts. Quite a few noted in the comments last time about the coil collapse. That's what's causing that little dip at the start, but it's out of the equation within 5 or 6 milliseconds as the flyback diode routes the spike back through the relay coil. Looking further in time to around the 20 millisecond mark, the crosshairs state around 6.4 volts on red. 70% of that is approximately 4.5 volts, and if we look down to the blue trace, we can see that point's not far off. Basically, the blue line follows 70% of the red line all the way down due to the potential divider effect of where I've placed the probes. So, that's nice, um, but what I actually want to measure is the length of time the relay contacts are held open for after external power is cut because that controls how long the next relay in sequence receives its external power for. To do this, I'll take the circuit as it stands currently, move the red probe to one of the relay contacts, and then swap the relay and capacitor back to their original positions. Let's give this circuit a whirl and see what we get. Okay, so back at the breadboard again, and uh, this time now you can see that uh, we put the uh, resistor and capacitor back round the other way. Um, so now it's capacitor first and then resistor. Uh, Probe-wise, the blue one is just coming in just north of the capacitor on the positive side, and uh, the negative side is coming just the other side of the capacitor. Now, note it needs to come there, not this side of the resistor, otherwise I've got that same potential divider problem again. Um, so having it just the other side of the, both sides of the resistor basically is almost treating it as a battery, so I'll see the voltage a lot across it uh, uh, over time. So that's all good. Uh, and the red probe, that now comes in over here. 
Now this is going to be quite difficult to see, but uh, basically the switch contacts, I'm providing power down to the common uh, switch contact, and then the uh, normally closed one comes back down here and goes off to the probe. So what that will tell me, basically the probe will tell me when that uh, switch is closed and when it's open, and that's really what I'm looking for here. So let's give this a whirl. Uh, as before, I can uh, press the button and on my uh, graph here you'll see the spike and uh, because I've got this set to trigger again you'll see it's uh, exactly at the point um, where the uh, switch comes off. So what can we see here? Well we can see that as the uh, power's coming down here um, there's a certain point where the uh, power is less than what can hold the uh, relay coil on and at that point the relay coil lets go and the switch drops out. Um, but notice here this mess here sort of goes off then back on again then then back off again. Um, and that's the contact bounce. Um, what's interesting though is how quickly that takes to come off. So uh, actually we're saying it might be this point where the power's dropping, but actually I know there'll be a bit of delay there. So it might actually be here where the power's dropping, and then it then takes this that long for the, um, for the switch to drop. But anyway, that, that's, that's what we're looking for, and that's looking good. Right, back to the slides. We're well acquainted with our relay circuit now, but there's a bit of hidden detail at the coil of each relay. Here's a close-up schematic. Over each relay coil is a diode placed in reverse bias. You might have heard this called a protection or flyback diode, or maybe something else, but it's there to provide a route to absorb the voltage spike created when the magnetic field in the coil collapses. When the what in the what does what? Well, the coil in a relay is an electromagnet, and when power is applied, it attracts a lever that moves a set of contacts. What might not be so obvious is what happens when the power is removed. With nothing to power it, the magnetic field collapses, but it doesn't leave without giving us a little gift. The collapsing field will create a reverse voltage in the coil, as we've now changed it from an electromagnet to a magnet electro, uh, which is a really dumb way of describing it, but there you go. Anyhow, there's energy stored in that coil that needs somewhere to go, and that's where the diode comes in. It provides a path for the energy to dissipate back through the coil. But why can't we just let that energy loose into the rest of the circuit? Why add extra components? Well, let's try an example where we have no protection at all. Here, the voltage spike is allowed to freely wander through the rest of the circuit. But how much voltage are we talking here? Surely it can't be more than the 12 volts we put in through the coil in the first place. Ah, well, let's jump to the scope and take a look. OK, so we've got the uh, circuit set up here. So this time we just have a uh, simple uh, relay just on its own. And I've taken the blue wire here, going to the positive side of the coil, and the green wire here, going back from the negative side. Um, so the blue probe is just uh, basically watching over that to see uh, what the voltage is looking like. Um, also, I've uh, brought in a uh, power supply over here into a set of the uh, contact switches, because what I want to do as well is see when those switches open. Um, so that's there as well, and that's going out on the red probe. Well, let's give that a try. And there we go. So uh, first of all, the red line, yeah, definitely just um, started coming off at that point. Um, but just behind it is the blue line going off, which is exactly what we expected. It's taken a certain amount of time for that switch to go off. But just look at what's happened down here. Uh, a massive spike's gone off the bottom of the page. Um, so the question is actually how, just how big is that? So if I uh, up the channel size, I'll take it to 50 volts um, and just take another shot at that. No, still off the page. Let's try 100. Ah, it's a bit more like it. So what can, can we say here then? So uh, obviously the uh, the red line is on a different scale. So you can see over here it's at 12 volts uh, going down to nothing, which is exactly what we expect. Uh, but the blue line here, we can see at the bottom, is going up for uh, minus 45 volts. So that's a, uh, a lot more than we were expecting. Uh, and that's because basically the core collapse is just feeding back through the probes. So it's, um, it's that's the only place it can kind of go at the moment. And the next question is what time, uh, how long was the delay from this point in the middle till here? So if we look here, uh, you can see that was minus 890 microseconds. So I ran that off to more or less one millisecond, um, so I'm not bothered about going any uh, further down than that. Um, but basically, yes, so from the point the power dropped, uh, the switch reacted within one milliseconds. Um, but yeah, quite a big spike going down there. And that's the problem with this unprotected circuit. All right, back to the slides. So a uh, high reverse voltage. Uh, but on the flip side, because the magnetic field collapsed quickly, the contacts pop open quickly too. 
And that's important if the contacts are passing a high current, because slowly separating the contacts could cause arcing across them, and ultimately could cause the contacts to weld together, rendering the whole relay useless. Now in this case we know that the only thing going through the contacts is the feed to the next relay stage, and from the diagram on the left we can see a couple of relay coils at 1029 ohms and 12 volts, uh, they'll consume around 11 milliamps each. Capacitors can be particularly greedy if left unchecked, but the resistor here keeps the maximum draw to 55 milliamps. So all in all there's roughly 77 milliamps in this circuit, so contact welding isn't much of a concern. And these relays have contacts rated for up to 2 amps anyway, although by that point you'd want to be giving some serious thoughts about contact damage. OK, same circuit, but uh, this time I've just popped a uh, diode just over there, and that's exactly the same diodes that are all on these boards up here, so that's one of the uh, four and four eights. Let's, uh, let's try this through the scope and see what difference it makes. So same again, we've got the uh, scope set up just as before, back to the 20 volt range, and... There we go. So, interestingly, now let's see what's different this time. So we can see the um, the time to release has definitely increased. So if I come here, uh, we can see now we're up to uh, sort of 2 milliseconds. So it has taken longer to do it, but notice that voltage spike has gone completely. In fact, actually, if we look down here now, we're looking at half a volt, um, which actually should be more or less the... Um, and the forward voltage of the diode. You can see it's restricted massively, but you can also see it's taking it now longer for this to get back down to normal again. So we've effectively um, reduced the voltage, but increased the uh, time of the uh, coil effect. Um, notice here now, now we're still not getting this um, this bouncing, which is interesting, because this is a very similar setup to the other ones, um, but a lot of that will probably down to the capacitor and the RC network. So um, half a volt, and uh, we're up to uh, two milliseconds. So this time we saw the spike was limited to half a volt. And that makes sense because that's around the forward voltage drop of the diode. However, because we're limiting the voltage, we've also increased the time it takes for the magnetic field to collapse. But actually, not quite as much as I was expecting. I was also expecting that because the magnetic field dies back relatively slowly, uh, we wouldn't get a clean separation of the contacts. It didn't actually look too bad, um, but it's likely we're not getting a nice snappy spring in back of the lever that operates the contacts. OK, so what other options do we have? Well, I have a trick up my sleeve, and it's another diode. This is no ordinary diode though, this is a Zener diode. And it has a special property that will allow current flow in the reverse direction after a certain voltage limit is breached. This is called the breakdown voltage. And normal diodes have it too, but it's much higher, and once breached, that diode is pretty much over. A Zener diode though can return back to its normal state afterwards. So in this circuit, the voltage spike comes out of the coil and hits the zener. Now it can't go any further until the voltage has built up enough. Once it has, then the current can continue back through to the coil. This allows us to choose how much voltage to permit, and the higher the voltage, the quicker the magnetic field will collapse, and the quicker the contacts will release. Let's get back on the scope again, and uh, try it with a 24 volt zener diode. OK, right, so we've uh, added the uh, zener diode to the circuit now, so that's... Uh, facing towards a negative line, and these dies are basically back-to-back, -back, so that one's facing towards a positive line, and that one's facing towards a negative line back-to-back. -back. Um, right, okay, so uh, scope is set up as well, so I've increased the range on the blue line to 50 volts because I'm expecting this to come in around, um, well, around 24 volts, really. Um, it should go to negative 24, so uh, let's give it a try. And there we go, that's pretty much what I was expecting to see, and if we look down at the bottom of the uh, chart here, uh, we can see that indeed, yes, it was minus 24 volts, and that's exactly what we wanted. Um, note in time, uh, let's see how long that took. Uh, and you can see now we're back to just below one millisecond again. So, um, yeah, looking uh, pretty good. And, um, yeah, that's definitely looking nicer than before. And again, you can see the amount of time it then takes all this to die down is by the time it's, uh, what's that overall, that'll be about two and a half milliseconds, uh, it's all stabilised. So, yeah, I mean, that, that looks absolutely perfect. So we saw that the spike was limited to 24 volts, but because that's more than before, we effectively trade a spike size for release time. In the rest of the computer, I'm less fussy about this effect, and uh, so a single diode is fine for protection, and because the currents involved are generally very low, the risk of trashing relays should also be low. Here, though, where the relays are going to get a lot of hammer, colloquially speaking, uh, it makes sense to put a bit more thought in. To be honest, given there's only one millisecond in it, I think I'll keep my existing test rig, as adding Zener diodes to that uh, will be a right pain. Um, but on my final design, I will add the Zeners in. 
Um, that will put my timing out by one millisecond, but in the grand scheme of things, that's fine. Right, that was quite a diversion. Uh, let's get back to that timing. Um, so what I need to know now is, given our new relay setup, at what voltage does the relay turn off? Back to the scope. Right, so we're basically back to the uh, same circuit we had before. Um, so we have, again, our uh, RC network here. Uh, blue probe is over the uh, capacitor, so we can see what's going on there. And a uh, red uh, probe is coming in for the uh, normally open switch. So uh, if we look back to the scope, uh, what we'd expect to see, as before, is a click will capture this pattern. So let's have a bit of a closer look at this now then. So uh, we know from uh, our experiments we just ran just now that uh, actually, although this is where the point where the switch starts dropping, it's more likely that it were probably about two milliseconds before when the actual uh, coil dropped. Uh, now again, there's a lot of guesswork going into this now because uh, also we've changed a lot of the parameters here and now taken the zeners off and things like that. But again, given the numbers we're dealing with, uh, it shouldn't matter because we're going to be able to get a rough timing anyway. Um, so what I need to do is looking down there, uh, see what voltage we have at that point. So if I look a bit further over, around two milliseconds before that point, the voltage is around 3.3 .3 volts. So my theory is, is that if I can um, make this uh, point happen um, 83 milliseconds after the start of this uh, point where the power is lost, um, then I've got pretty much my timing. So at the moment, actually, if we're two milliseconds there, that point's actually happening uh, about 28 milliseconds before. So it's taking 28 milliseconds to get down to 3.3 uh, volts. And that's going to be a magic number. So what I need to do is find a way of getting it to take 83 milliseconds to get down to that. Or rather, this point two milliseconds before we need the switch off. So actually, if we're looking here, we could say, well, let's allow two milliseconds for the switch to turn off. So actually, I need to reach this point in about 81 milliseconds. So I want to reach 3.3 .3 volts within 81 milliseconds. OK, let's, uh, let's see what we can do with that calculation. Let's give the maths a try then. As a starting point, I've got the formula for VD at the top, which calculates that after 20 milliseconds discharging, there'll be 6.72 volts left in the circuit on the right. We know that the discharging circuit has a time constant of 34.5215 milliseconds. So the question is, what timing constant is required to hit 3.3 volts after 81 milliseconds? Well, we can rearrange the formula in terms of RC, the timing constant, to get an answer of 62.74 milliseconds. We can plug that back into the discharge time constant calculation to work out values for the resistor and capacitor. Let's first try sticking with a 47 microfarad capacitor, as I think that will land us near enough. And that comes out at 820.4 ohms. Now I can't hit that exactly, because resistors come in standard values, but I can combine a 470 ohm resistor with a 330 ohm one in series to get a total of 800 ohms. Let's try running that back through the formulas in the other direction. OK, that's looking promising, um, but there's a problem. The time to charge the capacitor is now too long and exceeds the 83 millisecond limit. Looks like I'll need to up the capacitor size so I can bring down the resistance. Let's try 100 microfarads. That works out as needing a resistance of 112.9 ohms. I can either go with a single 100 ohm resistor or a 100 plus a 10. Let's try the 100 ohm first, as that's less components. That's looking a lot better now. The charging time constant is 10 milliseconds, so the capacitor should be fully charged in around uh, 60 milliseconds. And 81 milliseconds into discharging, we should be around the right voltage for the relay core to switch off. The only last thing to check is that the amount of current the capacitor will initially draw. By Ohm's law, 12 volts through 100 ohms will be 120 milliamps, uh, which I'm comfortable with. OK, let's give this a uh, try on the breadboard and see if the timing is in the right ballpark. Right, so same board layout, uh, this time with a 100 microfarad capacitor and a 100 ohm resistor. Uh, so exact same setup as before, uh, we've got the scope all ready to go here. Let's give this a try. Okay, right, oh messy, very messy. Okay, well, first of all, let's have a look where we've got to. So this is now from the point we believe the power started dropping away. Uh, it took 73 milliseconds before we uh, started the contacts dropping out. So we're a little shy there of where we want to be by uh, what, about seven, seven, eight sort of milliseconds. But what's interesting is this. So uh, what we're seeing here is that um, sort of 18 and a half milliseconds later, that's how long it takes the switch to turn off. 
So actually the total time is actually longer. Um, but I don't like this bit at all. Uh, I think actually this is going to start causing problems, especially in the uh, clock. So it's uh, obviously that disconnect's happening a lot slower now. Uh, the contacts are parting uh, a lot slower. So I think I'm going to have to do the thing I didn't want to do, which is try popping those zeners in line with the diodes. So what I'll do first of all, I'm going to snip the diodes first and just see if that does have the effect of speeding this up. So uh, let's do that now. Okay, so they're disconnected now. So uh, it's these two relays here that I'm using and at the front now, those two dials have been disconnected. So now we should get a lot of that uh, negative uh, current coming back for, because there's no protection around those anymore. Uh, but what I'm hoping I'll see now is this will, uh, will disconnect much quicker. Let's give that a try. And that makes no difference whatsoever, which is interesting. See if you can tell me in the comments why, why that is, what's causing uh, this. Uh, I'm going to have a play with this, but I'm, I'm going to stop the video here now because uh, uh, although it's only a few minutes for you guys, it's been a few hours for me, so I'm going to take a break and then have another look at it. But uh, yeah, let's pick up next time.